All right. Hello. Um, good day, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us in today's event. I am Anne Pereres with NGO Forum on ADB, and I will be your moderator for uh, today's event. During this uh, week, the Asia Clean Energy Forum is being hosted by the Asian Development Bank and the CSOs across Asia and uh, the communities we represent with are raising our concerns over the lack of space in uh, the said forum, where this quote-unquote uh, green energy infrastructure investments are being moved forward, affecting the lives and the livelihoods of communities and uh, workers. As a response, the NGO Forum on ADB, together with our allies with Center for Energy, Ecology and Development, Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, and the CE Bankwatch, we are hosting this online press conference to call out the bank for a need to support a genuine and people-centric renewable energy. The ADB should uh, put a stop in pushing for risky resource-intensive energy ventures that are neither clean nor just. To officially kick, uh, start this uh, press conference, I'd like to introduce to you my colleague, uh, Tanya Lee. Uh, she's been working uh, in terms of shifting uh, both the portfolios of Asian Development Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank in terms of its energy policy and finance priorities to move away from these large-scale uh, resource-intensive and uh, fossil fuel-reliant uh, options. So Tanya will uh, provide insights as to what is essentially wrong with ADB's uh, Asia Clean Energy Forum and its energy lending portfolio. Tanya? Thanks, Anne. Um, and yes, first I'd like to extend a message of solidarity to our colleagues, um, the NGO Forum's member organizations and our allies, whether they're in Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Maldives, or elsewhere uh, across the region or here in the Philippines, who are putting their lives on the line each day to raise concerns about energy infrastructure projects advanced as part of the green energy transition by the ADB as well as, other, as, well as other international financiers. And that includes hydropower dams, waste energy projects, geothermal drilling, uh, LNG terminals, floating solar projects, and carbon capture projects. Despite the, the focus of um, this year's ASEF on innovative and integrated solutions for a low carbon future, the voices of these communities uh, um, have been absolutely absent, uh, as has local, national, and regional workers' organizations that are struggling for dignified uh, working conditions, and critically absent too have been re representatives of indig indigenous peoples' organizations First, in terms of showcasing locally rooted, appropriately scaled, non-resource intensive systems. But secondly, crucially, there appears within this year's Asia Clean Energy Forum to have been no noticeable attempt on the part of, of the ADB or other proponents of energy projects there to consider free prior and informed consent. So who has been in the room so far that we've seen at the Asian Clean Energy Forum? It's been primarily private sector proponents centering the discussion on risky speculative projects such as, um, as green and blended hydrogen production and carbon capture projects, waste energy projects and others. For these, we remain highly cognizant that the key actors behind the push for a hydrogen society and for the expansion of carbon capture schemes are primarily oil and gas companies. Um, as by design, these are the ones that will reap the profit of prolonged reliance on fossil fuels. So in this regard, in relation to ASAF, we are reiterating our collective assertion to the ADB that the surest way to tackle economic climate and energy injustice and to support a rights-based pathway that aims to avoid overshooting 1.5 degrees would be to pivot entirely away from the systems that are carbon and resource intensive, as well as heavy greenhouse emitters. Now, we've seen that um, already at ASAF that ADB management has suggested that there needs to be an overhaul of the energy system. But the question remains as to what, in whose interest 
will this overhaul happen? And whose livelihoods will be on the line? For this, we're recalling the dire warnings of the IPCC's assessment report number six, which was recently, uh, well, which was released this year, and which currently does pronounce that the narrow wind, that there's only a narrow window left to avoid catastrophic global warming. And that this, the best chance we have of limiting global warming would be to rely on limited or no use of engineered carbon capture technologies. So why is the ADB pushing this forward in ASAF 2022? Carbon capture has been exposed as a failed technology over decades of piloting um, in which there's been systematically poor records of carbon capture rates and it's incurred ex exorbitant rates of um, costs in terms of energy, um, energy prices. Meanwhile, the infrastructure build out needed to support these types of carbon, uh, carbon capture structures and injected into storage sites requires vast areas of land, risking dispossessing people um, and, and a rain, in a range of types of communities. Likewise, green hydrogen that's made through um, electrolysis of renewable energy is reliant on large scale wind and solar farms that also require onerous usage of local water and land uses. Ultimately then, the question, the re, there is no reason for the ADB to consider sinking scarce public resources into technocratic pathways, such as those being promoted at ASEF 2022, that will merely delay the needed energy transition. Indeed, it is, despite the bank's apparent preparedness to, to scale up climate financing, that we are still awaiting clear time-bound commitment from the bank related to phasing out oil and gas reliant on infrastructure and other climate misaligned investments, including waste to energy projects and large scale hydropower projects. In the coming, for the coming speakers who will speak after me, they will speak specifically to some of these cases of what exactly ADB's investments mean for communities on the ground. Um, they will also indicate, and this, I'll just raise this briefly from our perspective at the NGO Forum in relation to the ADB's energy transition mechanism, which has been referenced in several ASEF sessions. But essentially, this is a scheme to retire, it's a market-based scheme to retire coal projects that has been characterized to date by a complete lack of transparency and has as of yet failed to meaningfully take into account the perspectives of community-based and workers federations grounded in specific local and country contexts. Indeed, this mechanism that the ADB is promoting as uh, part of the push from coal to clean energy in fact, um, has no guarantees that there would be no um, support for, it, or th there's no guarantees that they would not undermine ILO core conventions, nor the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And there's no guarantee that a closure of, of the coal projects that they would support would result in cleanup, land reclamation, redistribution, and redress for harms wrought on community, worker, and environmental health. Moving forward from this year's ASEF, we as the NGO Forum and our allies are reiterating our call on the ADB management and board to consciously pivot away from financing false energy and climate solutions. Decisions taken in this regard not only have real impacts on people's livelihoods across the region, but also determine if the pathway followed is one which will hasten or which will undermine progress towards a just, inclusive, sustainable, and rights-based transition. Regardless of what happens, we are assuring the ADB that civil society groups remain attentive to the plans they are advancing for green and not so green energy investments, ready to hold the bank accountable. As for us, at stake is the stark reality of who may live and who may perish in the years ahead. Thanks and I'll pass it on to my colleagues. Thank you, Tanya, for highlighting that there is lack of uh, indigenous people's uh, communities and representatives 
in uh, the current uh, Asia Clean Energy Forum right now, and it's a room filled with uh, private sector. And uh, you also pointed out the critical question in terms of whose interest is uh, the bank actually uh, pushing forward when, when they are talking about this overhauling their uh, energy lending portfolio. Uh, moving forward, uh, our next uh, speaker will be um, Avril uh, de Torres, uh, Deputy Executive uh, Director of uh, Center for Energy, Ecology, and uh, Development. So Av uh, leads the action research and uh, policy engagements of uh, SEED, and uh, she also offered uh, the paper Leaving Behind ADB's Energy Legacy. Av? Thank you, Anne. Good day, everyone. My apologies for not being able to turn on my camera for this press conference. Um, two weeks prior to the Asia Clean Energy Forum, the Center for Energy, Ecology, and Development published a report entitled Financing a Fossil Future. The report began with a discussion on how from being coal's last bastion, Asia is now swiftly turning into a hub for natural gas, or more appropriately called fossil gas, and LNG. Governments and power companies are promoting massive gas expansion plans in the region under the guise of development. Today, Southeast Asia has 117 gigawatts of new fossil gas power plant capacity in the pre-construction stage and this eclipses East Asia's 77 gigawatts. In addition to power plants, there's also a massive buildup of LNG terminals in the region. This report looked into who are the developers and financiers that are dooming our region into a fossil future. And we found that ADB is among the notable public financiers helping bankroll the fossil gas industry in our region since the Paris Agreement was signed in the end of 2015. Alarmingly, 84% of total financing for midstream gas projects mapped in the report were found to have been linked to public financial institutions. But ADB's financing is not limited to the midstream industry. It is also found to have fun funded the 2,500 megawatt gas power plants <clears throat> in Chunburi and Rayong provinces in Thailand. As ADB hosts its annual ASEF, we want to remind it that fossil gas is not a clean energy. It is primarily composed of methane, which leaks into the atmosphere at every stage of its life. Methane traps heat in the atmosphere far more effectively than carbon dioxide. In the IPCC's 2021 assessment report, it calls for strong, rapid and sustained reductions, not only of carbon dioxide, but also of methane emissions. Apart from climate considerations, Southeast Asian countries will also have to confront the many challenges that LNG dependent countries are facing today, including grave economic burdens. <clears throat> The prime example would be the spiking gas prices as exacerbated by the Russia-Ukraine war. In the Philippines, the biggest gas developer, San Miguel Corporation, has two fossil fuel subsidiaries that are already requesting for price adjustments from the Energy Regulatory Commission, citing volatility of fuel costs and precisely the Russia-Ukraine war. These plants are SPPC's Elihan Fossil Gas Power Plant in Batangas and SMEC's Coal Plant in Pangasinan. This should already serve as a warning sign against massive fossil gas expansion and the continuation of coal power plants and their volatile fuel costs. Despite CSO's strong demands for a more ambitious energy policy, ADB still allowed selective support for midstream and downstream natural gas in its 2021 energy policy. It took 12 years for ADB to recognize that financing coal goes against the development it claims it wants to achieve for the Asia Pacific region. And now by keeping the door open for fossil gas, ADB is sustaining its dirty energy legacy. 
and merely switching from one dirty fuel to another, dooming the region to a climate catastrophe. <clears throat> Even ADB's no coal policy also raises several questions as the ADB now pursues its energy transition mechanism or ATM. To name a few of the questions we've asked, um, there are questions that remain on the economic feasibility of the ETM and whether high costs, stranded assets risks, and other policy, legal, and transition risks will inevitably force these coal plants to retire earlier than expected. These questions become more relevant if ADB will not put in place a concrete policy that prohibits them from engaging entities with conflicting interests. These include those that are still funding, whether directly or indirectly, coal-fired power plants, or are still proposing to develop new coal projects or coal expansion projects. There are also questions on whether the proponents of these plants will be absolved from complaints of human rights and environmental violations, whether the coal plants that will be retired early will be replaced by renewables and not other fossil fuel projects like fossil gas power plants, um, in the Philippines, there's a massive pipeline of projects, over 29 gigawatts. And of course, there are also questions on whether ADB will ensure that these coal plants will charge lower generation rates to consumers, especially in countries like the Philippines where fuel costs are automatically passed on to consumers. These questions were unfortunately not concretely addressed in short meetings that we've had with the ETM team where we had to compress several issues within a limited time. So to conclude, we have reiterated for the past ACES that ADB should play a catalytic role in leading the adoption of the most ambitious 1.5 degree Celsius Paris aligned energy policy and strategies and to finance the necessary energy transformation in the region. If ADB wants to be genuine um, wants to be a genuine climate and development bank, then we see no other path for it to take than to work with Asia Pacific peoples to advance renewables and pursue a 1.5 degree Celsius pathway without false solutions. If you want to read more about um, our report, Financing a Fossil Future, you can uh, download it from our website, seedphilippines.com. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ab, for uh, contextualizing your input in terms of uh, the increasing uh, gas prices right now, which is very relevant, not only here in uh, the Philippines, but across uh, the region. And that continued um, critique to the bank in terms of switching from one dirty uh, energy resource from uh, coal to uh, LNG and its impact uh, later on, its uh, repercussions which um, the people will naturally bear the brunt of. Um, moving forward with our uh, next uh, speaker, um, I'd like to call uh, Yubel uh, Putra. Uh, he is the Climate and uh, Clean Energy uh, Campaign Officer of uh, Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. And uh, he'll be talking about ADB and its uh, push for promoting waste to energy uh, incineration project, despite it being a, a false climate uh, solution. Yubel? Thanks, Anne. Um, can you show share and share my screen um, the presentation? I'll give you a sec. Okay. So, um, for a context, um, waste to energy incineration has been in ADB portfolio for more than ten years, but it's just recently in the last two three years when CSOs keep pushing. Uh, for the listing incinerator from the portfolio, they started to react, but the reaction is not what we're looking for. So uh, ADB kept pushing it as a climate solution, recently as an ocean pollution solution, and they're keep pushing another narrative that is not what we want uh, from the CSOs. Uh, next slide. So last year, um, Asia Clean Energy Forum claimed that they have um, discussion to include CSOs um, talking about low carbon technology, but that did not happen. And this year it did not happen as well. Um, so this is an action 
happened yesterday uh, in Cebu. It's a community action by Cebu communities that rejecting waste energy incinerator funded by ADB in the form of a public-private partnership program. It's difficult to track, to be honest, compared to most projects. If you Google it, it's difficult uh, to find it on ADB's website. This type of projects lead community um, to fight against it because there is no meaningful consultation, no transparency. It takes um, a lot of time just to get ADB uh, listen to our concern and at one point, actually, ADB said that they are not financing waste energy in the Philippines. So this contradiction and the no space for meaningful consultation led communities to protest. But what are the points that they are protesting about? Next slide. So ADB believes that waste energy incineration is renewable energy source and clean energy source. You can find it in every project, uh, WT project in their website. They also frame it as low carbon technology, Paris line in the form of green bonds, blue bonds, and recently climate financing project. And also part of circular economy, believing that it is a good way to deal with material in our waste and saying that it's a sustainable livelihood for waste worker creating jobs. And now they have this one project in Maldives claiming that it's a way to and plastic pollution by burning waste and also releasing the toxic ashes containing microplastic in it. But the thing is, as a multinational development bank, ADB should have um, learned from other institutions. In Europe, the in, uh, EIB, the European Investment Bank, has stopped financing waste incinerator. EIB is one of the biggest banks in the world. And this is because the um, EU Commission stated that waste incineration is no longer considered as a sustainable finance in the taxonomy. It is carbon intensive, meaning they, they emit a lot of greenhouse gas emission, undermines the, uh, the country effort to reach carbon neutrality on time, and also it harms rather than support transition towards circular economy, meaning waste prevention, recycling, because it requires 20 years of contract to keep burning a huge amount of waste while countries are pushing for higher recycling rate, reduction rate, and everything. So um, this contradiction is what I'm going to present in the next slides. Next, please. One thing, it's not clean. It's not clean and not renewable energy. This is a research uh, from a US incinerator showing how much greenhouse gas, gas emission emitted by an incinerator. You can see there's two parts of um, two, two big color here. The darker one is fossil carbon dioxide. The lighter red is biogenic, meaning it's burned from um, organic waste, like food waste. So uh, you can see that it's almost comparable with coal if you only see the red part, meaning when you burn plastic, uh, and compared it with coal, it's almost comparable. But the thing is, you burn not only plastics, which is fossil fuel, but also food waste. And this is what ADB doesn't show to, to us. They doesn't want us to know that it also emits uh, gases when you burn organic waste. So the total combined greenhouse gases from the plastic, the cardboard, the food waste, compared to coal, is almost twice, it's dirtier. And even when compared with, with gas or other fossil fuel, as Avril said, it's, it's substituting one dirty energy with another. In this case, it's worse, it's dirtier. So that's why it's not clean and not renewable, especially when you're reading plastic, which is also another kind of fossil fuel. Um, next. And when you compare it, uh, one of the uh, narrative that uh, ADB in ASAF promotes, it, it, it's trying to bring this um, low carbon, affordable um, energy for a transition, you know, uh, in the region. But the thing is, waste to energy incinerator is the most expensive way to generate energy and also the most expensive way to deal with waste, even when compared to landfilling. And here you see the, the purple line showing that compared to natural gas, natural gas, it's twice um, the amount 
um, you need it to be invested. And if you check with coal, it's even higher. It's still higher. So it's not reasonable for ADB to push this when it's more expensive and definitely not cleaner than other fossil uh, fuel power, uh, power plants. Next. And in fact, why Europe uh, you know, um, exclude the incinerator from their climate policies? It's because when compared to the average electricity grid or power grid in Europe, the emission is twice than the average. So uh, it's definitely a huge barrier towards low carbon transition because this carbon intensity or the amount, the intensity of greenhouse gases emitted to generate one unit of energy need to be stay at at least 540 gram CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour for 20 to 30 years. So you will be having um, a situation where you cannot uh, escape from it, especially when you have signed a contract and um, it's, it's making the country inflexible to shift towards the real renewables like solar and wind. Next. And when they're talking about sustainable livelihood, it's also not the case. Um, here you can see that a landfill and incinerator only create two jobs per 10,000 tons of waste treated per year. Compare it with composting or recycling, you can have like 10 to 100 times more jobs, green jobs, local jobs for communities compared to incinerator. Next. And uh, when the ADB say that it's a safe way uh, to deal with waste, when we burn it, we use the most advanced high-tech technology, it's not the case. We know that most countries and ADB refer to Europe for the standard on operating waste to energy. And recent studies from the Netherlands, Lithuania, Czech Republic, and Spain shown that the majority of chicken eggs, like free-ranging chicken, uh, chicken uh, they, take, they, they take the axe and test these axe for toxic um, chemicals. And the majority of axe uh, are found to exceed the EU limits for food safety on dioxins, furan, and other toxic chemicals. Um, and it's not only around the axe, uh, in the axe around the incinerators, but also in the pine needles, the mosses, the vegetation around the incinerator in those four countries. Uh, show high elevation of dioxin level, which is very dangerous, very toxic um, in the vicinity of the waste incinerator. And also there are many chemicals, toxic substances that is not regulated uh, globally when talking about incinerator, like uh, microplastic. There is no regulation talking about microplastic in, in the ash or the air emission. Also with plastic additives that is toxic like uh, PFAS, PHH, everything is not, you know, some, some, when they say like they are monitoring it, uh, some regulation actually uh, doesn't really put the details of these toxic substances released uh, by the incinerator. Next. And this is the evidence from our region, from Asia. So recently in Seoul, South Korea, um, workers like, 10 workers in an incinerator plant in Seoul has been identified to have a dioxins and other uh, toxic chemicals in their blood. Similarly, it also happened in Delhi where they found the incinerators has um, passed the threshold for the dioxin limit several times, almost like five times uh, the amount um, that is generally produced uh, or reported. And in China, there is one worker that um, reported that he and his son has these toxic chemicals in blood. So uh, when it's tracked back, it's clear that the relation uh, when the, he worked inside the plant, it brings back the toxic to the, his daily life and then inherit it to the child. Next. Um, given all of that fact, over the last 10 years, ADB has burned more than 1 billion US dollar to push countries installing toxic and protective waste incinerator around Asia. That's more than 20 projects in the countries you can see on the screen. And uh, worse, that they frame this in their, uh, the, the way that is very misleading, very greenwashing. Next slide. 
First, they claim that it's renewable. It's clear or not. It's clearly not uh, low carbon. And the way they do this uh, is aside from grants or loan, which is uh, relatively more easy to track, they have technical assistances or sub projects or sometimes PPP projects that is hidden from the public. Uh, the one in Philippines in Cebu is a PPP project that has no disclosure of information publicly. We don't know what's happening, what's the negotiation, what's the terms, what's the environmental impact assessment. It's unclear, but we know that ADB is pushing for it through technical assistance uh, to build the PPP project. And there are six listed waste to energy products um, listed as green bonds or blue bonds eligible. Uh, two of them are in Vietnam and Maldives. And at least four are listed as climate finance project uh, in China, Uzbekistan, Marshall Island, and the Maldives. Yeah, next. Uh, these are some um, examples. Um, so first, from Cebu, uh, there is a violation of national law because in Philippines, there is a standing ban on waste incinerator through the Clean Air Act and also ecological solid waste management. But um, still, ADB pushed for waste energy project through technical assistance, diluting and weakening uh, this national safeguard standards. And through the uh, screening and the categorization, uh, all type of assistance from ADB um, need to have due diligence, yet the TAs, technical assistance, have not published safeguard documents in the website, but still generating ad advice and support to the local government by passing the national law. And uh, the environmental assessment, um, the project also has been awarded without complete engineering design. So it's progressing without the details, without the permit. Um, and the consultation was not there. Uh, the communities uh, did not know what happened. And compensation for economic displacement, uh, especially when we involve worse workers around the landfills, it's also not considered. Next. Um, next slide, please. So in Vietnam, um, the, in the Vietnam, we have uh, some findings from their own report that ADB environmental and social monitoring reports show that the dioxin and foreign are not monitored and only monitored, um, they're supposed to monitor it once every three months by third party laboratory. And it only sampled two hours per sampling. So that means uh, over 8,000 hours operation per year, it only have 0.1% covered from the total operation, the annual operation. And this clearly doesn't really protect the, um, the, the societies because you never know when the incinerator release these toxic uh, pollutants because dioxins are formed when the engines are heating up or cooling down. So if you see from the 8,000 hours per year, we, have, uh, we will have a lot of startup shutdowns and not forget to mention technical accidents or bypassing um, that that is occurred that has occurred in other uh, incinerator in Europe as an example yeah that's the my presentation hopefully it helps um thank you thank you Yubel for uh, that pre presentation and uh, clearly arguing that the waste to energy uh, incineration projects uh, these are definitely not clean uh, nor renewable uh, as what ADB is trying to uh, put forward. And uh, for our uh, last uh, speaker, um, we have uh, Andre uh, Relev, the biodiversity campaigner of uh, CE uh, Bankwatch. So his advocacy work uh, involves uh, protecting forests and wetlands, coastal habitats and mountains. Uh, Andre? Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning uh, here in, in Europe. Um, thank you very much, Anne. Um, well, um, we, uh, I would just want to give some examples of renewable projects, which are problematic, uh, financed or in the pipeline of ADB. Uh, we fully support the upscaling of investments in uh, renewable energy, but this should not be at the cost of biodiversity loss. 
uh, the biodiversity and climate crisis can and must be addressed together. And what we have seen all around Asia and the Caucasus region is that the lack of strategic planning and cumulative impact assessments means that many hydro, wind and solar projects in the ADB pipeline are wrongly placed. I would uh, like to share my screen for some photos now. Let's see if it's visible. Can you see the, the photos now? Yes, we can see it, Andre. Yes, thank you. So uh, first, I think you all have heard about the Nesker Dam project in Georgia. Uh, the ADB still hasn't withdrawn from the project. Besides that, um, the complaint mechanisms of um, the other multilateral banks, um, EBRD and EIB, have clearly shown that uh, the project violates the, the indigenous communities' rights of the Swan people there, as well as it will have uh, significant impacts on, on biodiversity, uh, like flooding the, the primary forests you, you see here on, on this photo. Um, the Nesco River and the forests around it are, are unique. They're really primary, they're untouched, and that's that's something rare, not only in the Caucasus, but in the whole Eurasia region. Uh, but I would like to talk a, a bit about wind and solar projects, which are, if they're well-placed, they're a good solution to the, to the climate, class, uh, cl climate crisis. Uh, one second, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we had a recent uh, visit to Uzbekistan. You know that the IDB and um, many multilateral banks have significantly increased their financing in the last years. And uh, that uh, is related to some political changes in the country, but we still have to say that, that uh, Uzbekistan is, is not a fully democratic country and there are some problems which are shown with these renewable projects. Uh, the first one is the, the Bash wind farm project, which is uh, promoted by Aqua Power, a Saudi Arabia company. It is a huge project, 500 megawatts. And uh, the problem is that, like with with many, with all uh, basically renewable projects in Uzbekistan, uh, the the selection of the site was done uh, by the government before uh, any impact assessment, social or environmental impact assessment. So, uh, like with all the projects I'll, I'll present here, the Basically, the environmental impact assessment studies are just a formality. Uh, the, 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 the way things work in Uzbekistan is that the state decides uh, to uh, acquire some of the land uh, for these renewal projects. They select the promoter and just after that, the, the studies are done. So what that means that it means that there are no alternatives for site selection. This means that there is no strategic planning. This means that there is no cumulative impact assessment. And you see the result here. This is an important bird area, which is a bit difficult to pronounce, but it's Ayakagitma Lake in the middle of the desert, uh, where uh, thousands and thousands of birds winter, but also a lot of birds migrate there. And the wind farm is placed just next to it. Uh, it will have very significant impacts on the birds which, which breed and migrate and winter in this area. And uh, yeah, so just, ju just some photos here. Uh, the, the lake is at the back. Next to it, there's some cliffs with, with some very endangered species of birds which nest there. And then the steps starts. The, the, if, the, if the wind farm was placed about 10 kilometers away from the lake, the impacts would not be so significant, but this was only visible after the environmental impact assessment studies were done. And uh, it's, it's already late to, to change anything. The, the government has decided what to do with the land. This is uh, uh, some, some photos of, of the lake. And uh, 
Uh, and yeah, it is one of the few important bird areas in, uh, in Uzbekistan. Most of the territory of the country is um, desert or semi-desert, but these islands, these oases like, like this are, are where really the, the biodiversity is concentrated. So uh, it's still improved as far as I know by, by IDV, but uh, it, it should be important to have a debate on projects like this. Uh, then we have uh, the, the Zaravshan wind farm. Uh, this uh, wind farm is located next to Mount Aktau. Here you see the area. Uh, the Mount Aktau is the highest point in the desert, which means that it is the most important spot, the most important uh, mountain in the, in the middle of thousands of square kilometers of desert. Uh, huge biodiversity is concentrated here. And I would say that for a wind farm, this is the, the worst location possible. Uh, the birds, like this one you saw here, the black vulture, near threatened, they nest on the cliffs. They nest on, on the cliffs, which are uh, above the desert. And on the plateau above the cliffs is where the, the wind turbines are meant to be placed there is no possible mitigation measure which will avoid in the 25 or 30 years of operation of a wind farm uh, to avoid the collision with, with the, the generators, with the turbines. Uh, so again, if there was a possibility to choose between different alternatives of location, if there was a cumulative impact assessment, the, the, for sure there would have been a better location for the, the wind farm. And even, even more, if, if there was a possibility to choose between solar and wind, the solar uh, project here would have much less significant impacts on biodiversity. But, but as I previously said, the project sites were chosen by the government and only when the promoters were chosen, the environment and social impact assessment was, was carried out. And uh, just one more example. Uh, this is the, the Samarkand uh, uh, solar project already built about 100 megawatts. Uh, it, it doesn't have significant uh, problems for biodiversity, significant impacts for biodiversity. Uh, it shouldn't have significant impacts on people, but uh, the, the project is 100 megawatts, but the village next to the, the, the solar project has no electricity and has no drinking water. So with minor investments from the promoters, in this case, it's the French company Total, the, the livelihood of people ne living next to the solar project would have uh, improved significantly, but not, not really. This is like uh, uh, an isolated area. You see that it's completely separated from the, the rest of the, of the step. Uh, the grazing is not accessible for people in the area of the, of the solar project. And as I said, with from a hundred million uh, investments, if 10,000, uh, dollars were invested for for the livelihood of people it could have improved their situation but but no they don't have water they don't have electricity there so <clears throat> the question is um, why why is uh, is the community not supported by the multilateral banks by the promoters of such projects uh, and and again uh, uh, we uh, that they're land was which they had leased for for 45 nine years for grazing was taken by the government there is plenty of land around that's not the big problem but again the process is not not open and, and not democratic so thanks a lot i'll be happy to answer some questions thank you andre for uh specifically pointing out that the push for uh, renewable energy, it should not be at the cost or at the expense of uh, biodiversity. Uh, so at this point, um, I'll just have a, a quick run through of what we have uh, raised so far in terms of the issues 
and then we will uh, open uh, the floor for uh, questions. So this um, online press conference, it's about calling uh, ADB to stop financing all of these claims on uh, false uh, solutions. So from the first uh, presentation of, of Tanya, so she also mentioned about uh, this push of uh, the ADB on uh, green hydrogen, which are reliant on uh, solar and the uh, wind farms, which are also resource intensive. So again, the push for the bank to pivot away from uh, this uh, false climate and uh, energy solutions from the presentation of a uh, seed. They've talked about that right now there's 117 uh, gigawatt fossil gas capacity in Southeast Asia. And uh, they found out that in their uh, study, uh, ADB is one of the biggest uh, public financier uh, in terms of energy transition mechanism that is also uh, being put uh, forward uh, by uh, the bank. Um, we have raised our concerns that uh, this mechanism um, has the tendency to uh, really overshoot the nationally required uh, targets to uphold uh, the 1.5 degree uh, trajectory in terms of our commitment to, um, to Paris. Uh, and then uh, Yubel from Gaia also talked about uh, this waste to energy uh, projects. Uh, he presented that these are in fact uh, uh, more expensive, and if not the most expensive, uh, than coal and these the, renew the real uh, renewable energy uh, projects. And uh, he also pointed out its uh, impacts to uh, incinerator uh, workers. And uh, lastly, um, Andre had mentioned um, several of these uh, projects that uh, the ADB were in. There's no strategic planning. Uh, there's an inadequate um, impact assessment that was uh, undertaken by uh, the bank. Uh, so yeah, I'm mindful of, of the time. We have like roughly 10 minutes, uh, more or less, uh, for your uh, questions. So uh, you can uh, raise your hand or key in your question into the chat box. And then um, if uh, I have called you, can you mention your, your name and your organization and uh, the question and uh, to which uh, speaker you'd like to direct uh, the said question? I think you're muted, yes. Oh, I am muted the entire thing. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Anyways, uh it was it was just a wrap up. Um so Okay, so um, I, I, uh, at, at this point, um, we'd like to uh, call on for like, okay, good, good. I, I thought uh, I missed the wrap up. Um, for any questions or clarifications you'd like to um, to be clarified on to our speakers. All right, great, good. thank you. So I'll. Okay, um, I think so far there's there's none. Okay, so um, um I I just like to post this question then to, to the to the speakers. Um at, at this point in, in time, so um, the ASEF, it's been an annual event. Uh the bank has been trying to uh function itself as, as a climate bank. So from from your perspective and perhaps your your la last uh thoughts to how can we still amplify our, our asks to the ADB to really veer away from this uh, false climate solutions, despite everything that we have uh, put forward? How can we still um, uh, push uh, the bank to really do, do the right thing for, for the communities and for the environment? Maybe I just want to to point out that the ADB is uh, currently um, changing its standards. Uh, mm -hmm. It is absolutely crucial that the the environmental and social standards and transparency of ADB are significantly improved, and uh, this should uh, be done uh, in a democratic and uh, transparent way with the involvement of all the communities 
which are uh, interested in uh, and impacted somehow by, by the bank's operations. Uh, it seems to be a very long process. So before that, all the, 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 the projects which are in the pipeline should be very transparent. And uh, I think there should be a discussion, uh, a strategic discussion, how and where to, to, uh, to place, uh, to, to locate uh, projects and what type of projects. And this, this, uh, this discussion should be done before the new standards are, are there because, because it's getting very, very urgent right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Andre. Um, Marit from uh, the Manila Times. Uh, yes, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, yes. I, um, I would just like to ask, uh, I, I do not know who could answer this uh, question, but um, is anybody involved in also pushing for uh, energy cons energy conservation and energy efficiency because I mean these are also uh, very effective ways of uh, reducing demand for for energy uh, because even well uh, we've heard about solar uh, renewable energy like solar and wind power now that, like wind power there are also issues you now in in countries like my country Denmark I'm from Denmark where uh, there's opposition to certain wind power projects because they affect the uh, the wild birds. So actually, those who are uh, into protecting nature, they're very often the ones opposing uh, new uh, wind power projects. So um, I think all technologies have their own uh, problems and issues. So uh, instead of only talking about specific technologies like um, maybe you could also uh, or maybe already doing it uh, call on institutions such as the ADB to do to put money into uh, supporting energy efficiency and conservation at all levels factory production factory uh, and for for people I mean of course the very poor they, it's hard for them to conserve energy because they might not even have electricity but many of us middle class people we can still find ways of having more sustainable lifestyles without necessarily sacrificing i mean and and uh, ha having miserable lives but we could have more sustainable lives while also cutting our <laughs> uh electric bills because that's really a pro whether we like it or not it's really going to be a bigger problem in the future with very high um, energy rates, whatever will be the technology used. So uh, I don't know if there's anyone here in the group who, who could say a bit about it and, and, and answer my question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marit, for, for that question. Would uh, any of the speakers have any thoughts on that? Uh, thoughts on energy conservation and efficiency? How to uh, reduce the, and it, it can also reduce the demand for, for energy. I can share some from the waste to energy perspective. So uh, waste to energy um, in like European countries and some Asian countries uh, are promoted as a source for heat, um, you know. Um, and the thing is, um, we might need to see things from different angle. Instead of the heat source, we, we will also need to look at the how the houses are designed, uh, insulation and, you know, green buildings that help to keep the energy in the house. And when talking about energy efficiency, uh, there, might, there might be some policies that need to, need to be tweaked um, to provide subsidies and incentives for um, you know, a more efficient um, energy usage. So this type of um, discussion need to happen, but I think it's difficult for EDB because they're looking for big amount of money to be loaned with high interest, right? And this type of uh, work with you know shifting policies or making a house uh, more uh, resilient towards climate change 
might not be as you know um, money earner for them. So um, definitely having more discussion, not only at one end of energy production, but also how it is distributed, how it's conserved, is something that AB need to do. Um, that's um, my point of view. Thank you, uh, Yubel. Uh, Andre, you want to? Yeah, I just want to add. Uh, I fully agree. Uh, but uh, but uh, but ADB, it's a Asian Development Bank, so it's not it's not a commercial bank. They uh, and the ADB has to uh, link its investments, its loans with, with development, with, with uh, the, the improvement of policies, with the improvement of legislation, with the, with the improvement of, of uh, support to, to people. So th th that is very, very true. Uh, investments in energy efficiency are much more um, important from climate change point of view and from social point of view than uh, the big um, the, the big mega projects which for example i presented in uzbekistan uh, and uh, that's that's why all these multilateral development banks should work more uh, with the the states they're uh, investing in uh, and not only with the, the private companies. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Shidar from Enveronix. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, you know, tell Marit that uh, there is a portfolio on en energy efficiency uh, in the ADB. Uh, there is a significant investment that's going on. Once again, that's also, you know, in the name of energy efficiency, what goes on uh, also needs to be questioned in terms of, you know, how they are promoting uh, uh, certain companies with uh, LED bulbs or, you know, now there is another uh, trend to, you know, kind of buy uh, for public sector or the government buy electric vehicles. So uh, in the name of energy efficiency also, you know, uh, what goes on needs to be, you know, kind of uh, looked at at some point of time. Thank you, Shridhar. Uh, Tanya, you want to add something? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the question. I, I just wanted to add a few things also quite similar to um, taking off what Sridhar was saying in the sense that um, currently the way that energy efficiency is framed by the ADB. First, um, if you look at, if we look at the energy portfolio of the, the um, proposed projects, uh, several of them are related to um, policy reform in terms of, in, at, at the government level and in the name of efficiency, but it means a push towards uh, privatizing and the private sector. Um, and, and so that raises a major concern amongst many civil society organizations and our allies in the labor movement um, and, and is not a, the kind of efficiency uh, that we would that would be rights based and that we would be um, hoping for. Secondly, um, in terms of efficiency um, that we've seen is that uh, that there's been, um, for example, the framing that since there, the introduction of the new energy policy uh, last year, there's only been a, a couple of gas power projects that have been approved or not approved, have been uh, proposed rather. Um, and one is, um, is on the ADB's website. And it in fact suggests that building a new gas project um, would be Better because that, and then they could. It, it's for it's the Rokia one um, combined gas power, gas cycle power in in India, and they're suggesting that this would, um, but that by building it, then India could retire older, non-efficient projects and could then replace them with newer, 
uh, newer gas projects. And again, that's not the kind of energy efficiency we're looking for. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to kind of link to uh, what Andre had said about the, the need really um, that we have been also calling for, for the ADB to, to really seriously consider um, when they're saying that there is a no project option, that that definitely should be um, considered all the time. And that um, on top of that, that um, before any project moves forward, there should be um, free prior and informed consent of communities. One thing also just actually to, to, um, to link to your comment about wind power projects, we noticed that the ADB is um, launching a new digital sensitivity mapping um, tool for wind power projects uh, to, to decipher avian flight paths. Um, and so our, um, and that it would be specifically for companies and developers that want to um, build large scale wind power projects. So our um, concern in that, in that regard would be that really before the developers think about this kind of sensitivity mapping with digital tools, they need to talk to communities first. And those are the one, th those are the very people that will also be able to tell them about the, the path flights of the, of the birds. I'll pass it back to Anne and if there are other questions. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, hopefully, uh, Marit, uh, the, the answers from, from our speakers and even from uh, Shidar are good. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. All right. So I think I'm, I'm not seeing any more uh, questions from uh, the body. So I think that concludes our um, online uh, press conference. So uh, we reiterate our call to the Asian Development Bank uh, that if it really intends to be the climate leader that uh, they claim, uh, they should stop doing business as usual and uh, stop financing this uh, false climate and uh, energy solutions. They should expedite the development of renewables that are not harmful to the people, uh, neither to the environment, and they should develop a genuine uh, people-centric and just sustainable uh, energy transition. So uh, good day, everyone. And uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You, Bell, do you want to stay a minute? Andre? Yep. Uh, do you guys want to stay a minute?